the way we think about ourselves is uh, less as a 3D printing company, but uh, more as a company that allows our customers to produce very complex parts, parts that they need for mission critical applications. And <coughs> really what we find is that the traditional additive manufacturing technology that has been out there for more than 25 years has been very limited in actually making the most useful parts that would be required by it. And uh, that was the impetus for starting the company. And our technology and our manufacturing uh, solution allows customers to make the parts that they really would like to make by metal 3D printing. And uh, uh, whether these are new products for much higher performance or whether these are legacy parts that they would like to move to additive manufacturing to accelerate their supply chain, uh, we actually allow them to make the parts that they need uh, and not being limited to a niche products so that they were limited by the existing technology. And when we think about your systems and how they differ from other powder bed fusions offerings in the markets, you've talked about your support free technology. Can you talk about why this is such a, a key competitive advantage for you guys? Yeah. So, uh, um, do, do you have the part here, uh, Bob? Yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll use the part to explain. <coughs> so uh, this, this part is a really good uh, kind of articulation of what, what we are talking about demonstration. So, so this is a cross section of a micro gas turbine and uh, uh, this is a scaled down version of a larger gas turbine. When this turbine is larger, uh, this is a cut by half, but when this gas turbine is larger, it's made by welding together 61 parts. When you scale it down, you cannot make this anymore because the parts are too small. Uh, this gas turbine has about 50 kilowatt power, uh, so it's a very powerful engine for hybrid drones in this case. So when you make it smaller, uh, the only way that you could actually make this part, because now it cannot be welded from many parts, is by 3D printing it. This is like the poster child of what you would want to use metal additive manufacturing or 3D printing for. But when you look at this part, you would see that there are about five internal cavities here that are completely enclosed from the outside world that uh, have no access uh, to, and those cavities would be filled with supports in a conventional additive manufacturing process. So by 3D printing those parts in a conventional 3D printing or additive manufacturing process, you are creating a very heavy paperweight that is basically a dead end. You cannot actually get to the part that you want. So being able to actually produce this type of parts, this is really when people envisioned a 3D printing of mission critical parts, high value parts, this is what people had in mind, but those type of parts actually are not accessible. So the ability to make those parts is one really critical differentiator. And then the second critical differentiator is the ability to make that in a very repetitive, repeatable quality and a, and a scalable supply chain. If you want, we can uh, discuss what exactly that means. If I think about kind of the market opportunity, you've, you've touched on kind of a, a $20 billion, what you kind of coined as, as a blue ocean market by 2030 that only Velo 3D's technology can address. Does this opportunity come entirely from high-end mission critical parts that you currently target? And how much do you still need to expand your materials portfolio to, to reach all of these applications? So um, uh, the market we are addressing, this uh, high, uh, high value emission critical application markets, is about a $100 billion market that is produced today by completely other manufacturing technologies, mostly a combination of casting, forging, welding, brazing. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are talking about very large uh, market for those industries in aerospace, in uh, defense, in uh, energy and in power generation. <coughs> In or, right now, a very small fraction of this market has been using additive manufacturing, and the portion of the market that has been using additive manufacturing is limited by the capabilities of the technology. So uh, our uh, strategy is to focus only outside the applications that everyone else can do, so that every application that we are uh, enabling, every customer that we are enabling, we are enabling a unique solution to that uh, that uh, is basically uh, uh, can work only with our system. Uh, creating this blue ocean uh, market for us. It is really important to understand that what we are talking about is a market in conversion, is a market in transition. So we are, uh, when you ask the question, what is the size of the market? The question is, what is the size of the market over time? Because we are transitioning an existing market uh, to uh, additive manufacturing over time. And to your question about the alloys, uh, we are adding right now about eight alloys every year. And uh, uh, so by 2030, I don't think that we are going to have, you know, 80 alloys. I think we will not need as many uh, to cover that. Uh, but uh, um, this, this is not going to be kind of the bottleneck to add, add, to add those alloys. 
And one thing that we were talking about here before we got up stage, on stage that was kind of interesting was uh, one of the headwinds to kind of adoption it, just in the broader industry has been kind of the knowledge base out there to operate some of these 3D systems. And, and you've talked about how for, for your additive systems, software is such a, a key advantage in, in being able to use these systems. Can you talk about kind of th that advantage that you guys have with your closed system and then kind of the skill set that you think is out there to kind of operate these at OEMs versus contract manufacturers and where you really see the bigger opportunity for uh, driving adoption? So, so this is absolutely right. So when you talk with some of the big OEMs, for example, when you talk with Boeing, they talk a lot about the challenge of uh, educating the workforce and building the trained workforce to uh, disseminate uh, additive manufacturing. One thing that uh, we are doing different, or two things that we are doing different. The first thing is uh, one of the main drivers for this uh, retraining of the workforce is the need to teach tens of thousands of engineers or even hundreds of thousands of engineers how to design for the limitations of additive manufacturing. And this is a monstrous uh, headwind, a monstrous task. One of the things we do is we say you don't need to do that. You can actually design the parts that you really need. You can actually take designs that you already have done and you can move them to additive manufacturing. You don't need to learn this magic word, this DFAM or DFAM, design for additive manufacturing. You could use design principles that you are aware, already uh, capable of and uh, are trained from school and from experience and just make the parts that uh, you really want and we will produce them. The second thing that uh, we have been doing is we observed that the vast majority of OEMs actually want to buy parts. They don't want to buy machines. If you think about a lot of those OEMs, there's so much red tape, so much difficulty in for them to bring a new manufacturing technology in-house. Uh, contract manufacturers can move much faster. So uh, we are building this scalable contract manufacturing network and one of the nice things about our solution is that all our machines are producing exactly the same outcomes with the same input. So when an OEM basically decides, I would like to get this file produced, uh, he can send this job to any of the 10 contract manufacturers in the United States that we have, and each one of them can produce this part exactly in the same way uh, without actually introducing new manufacturing intellectual property into this. So. Uh, we created this scalable supply chain, copy exact supply chain, where uh, OEMs can rely upon uh, to scale their business. In this supply chain, the people that operate our machines are technicians and operators. They are not PhDs, they are not scientists, they are not engineers, they are uh, simply technicians and, uh, and machinists because our machines, all the intelligence about how to run the process, how to um, plan the process is all done by our software. The machine is extremely simple to operate and prepare the jobs for production is also extremely simple to do. So we really uh, overcame and kind of bypassed one of the biggest challenges in adoption in, in this technology. And while we're still fairly early days in adoption, you have been shipping your, your Sapphire 3D printer since 2018. And I think currently you have about 38 systems in production. I was wondering if you can maybe highlight, I think you touched on it a little bit before, but uh, any examples of s some of the applications that are currently being supported by the systems in the field? Yeah, so uh, recently uh, we all have seen uh, uh, the uh, uh, launch to orbit of Astrospace. Uh, so uh, Astrospace has a lot of uh, parts on their engines uh, that are produced on our system. Uh, this is a great example of someone that is utilizing our contract manufacturing network. So instead of make, buying machines and running them, they, they have been uh, buying parts from our contract manufacturers to build those engines and, and they are stepping up their production now that they are in orbit. Uh, SpaceX uh, has uh, designed the Starship and the Raptor engines powering it around our uh, machines. And uh, we have tens of parts in the Starship uh, and in the Raptor engines that uh, are uh, uh, designed around our capabilities and really boosting the performance of those engines to the level that they are uh, enabled by our technology. If you think about kind of the, the customer profile, you mentioned OEMs, contract manufacturers, and, and, and then parts customers, right? And I think if you look at just the system shipments, four of your five shipments has passed forward over to existing customers. Can you kind of talk about the growth and adoption you see within existing customers kind of once they purchase that first system? And, and going forward, what role you think existing customers play versus kind of reaching out in, in to, to new customers to drive growth? Yeah, so uh, it is really important uh, to understand that uh, unlike our incumbent competitors, we have built a very focused uh, go-to-market strategy that is focusing entirely on customers that have manufacturing intent, taking products to serial production using our machines. What it means is that every customer that buys our machine is not buying a machine. They're buying a fleet, and they are buying the first machine in the fleet. So our salesperson is selling the first machine, but the rest of the company is going to sell the next uh, machines as uh, the customer is being successful with the first machine. So all those customers 
they expand both uh, what I think of as horizontally and vertically. So horizontally is as soon as they get confidence in what the technology can do for them, they expand in applications and they develop more applications that uh, they use the machines for. Vertically is as their products go through the qualification and then go through their product life cycle and they are ramping up productions, they need more machines to scale up the volume for these first products. So we typically see customers first expand horizontally and then expand vertically because of the relatively long life cycle uh, of development in, in the industries we, we operate. <clears throat> so uh, what we have seen in the past is that all our customers have been uh, buying more machines over time. We have this estimate of on average a customer, each customer in our customer base is going to buy between one and two machines, between one and one and a half machines um, a year, uh, from pr uh, each customer from previous years. And we are expanding the customer base. So in, in this year, our goal has been to triple the customer base and uh, almost triple the customer base. And uh, uh, we are very close to do, to do this. Uh, and uh, next year, our goal is to double the customer base. Um, and I believe uh, that uh, we uh, know how to do this and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to execute that. So if you think about this, uh, we have been tripling in the last few years our customer base. Next year, we are going to double it. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're projecting a little less than doubling starting from 2023 and, and, and beyond. But then each one of those customers is buying more and more machines uh, as uh, every year after that. Uh, so both those, all this information is kind of outlined in uh, our, uh, both in our earning calls as well as in our um, uh, presentation to the analysts that we, that we published. Uh, but, uh, and, and our intent is to continue to provide updates to uh, our progress against this model so that all of you as investors can see a very early indicators on how our future growth is, is going to look because uh, you can see if we are deviating from this pattern of repeat orders or if we are de deviating in this pattern of a new customers uh, acquisition, uh, either way you can see this as a prediction uh, on uh, future uh, growth. Uh, Great. And, and if we kind of look forward to the, the next kind of catalyst or leg up for revenue growth, I think you've highlighted uh, the Sapphire XC system, which is launching this quarter. Can you talk about what this new model brings to your portfolio and how, if at all, does the type of customer or application you're targeting with XC differ from the base Sapphire model? Yeah, so it's really important whenever we say XC to say Sapphire XC because it's really important to make sure that everyone understands that Sapphire XC is a Sapphire system and it's, the XC stands for extra capacity. It's a scale up. So the, uh, unlike many systems that you see uh, in the industry, the Sapphire XC was designed in such a way that you can scale up production for a product that you developed on Sephir and completely seamlessly transition this product to Sephir XC uh, without having to go through a new process development. So it's a scale up solution. So the idea here is uh, companies can develop their products on Sephir and then when they are getting to the stage that they need to buy three, four Sephirs to scale up production, instead of buying three, four Sephirs, they can buy one Sephir XC and get about three times better economy than if they would uh, do that on Sephir. So the way to think about this, it provides us a roadmap of very effective production equipment to develop the product, to develop the manufacturing process, to qualify the manufacturing process. Once you have done that, you can scale up the production much more economically with a more expensive, uh, uh, more uh, production uh, heavy tool but uh, this equipment has a much better economy of scale. So it's a really A-B punch. And, and it's really designed as a way to scale up production, not as a way to offer something completely different. So it's a direct linear uh, ex expansion of what uh, Sapphire is doing already. And can you remind us about the, the current backlog for Sapphire XE? And as we think about kind of the cadence of the ramp uh, beginning here in, in the fourth quarter and then going through next year, what that might look like? Um, yeah. So. Uh, uh, Bill, could you remind yeah, me what we, was the number that we reported? Uh, we have 40 million um, of firm bookings and 45 million of reservations, um, and one of the, so that's a total of 17. Um, the 45 million represents 17 firm orders um, that are firm contractual orders paid in advance, um, and uh, so one of those would be delivered this year, and the, the balance uh, presumably in, in 2022. So, so uh, uh, we expect to ship. Um, somewhere between 20 and uh, 24 Sephir XC systems next year. Uh, am I right? Yeah, probably. Tw we've got, you know, orders in the, firm orders in the book for 20, uh, for 17 already, so I would think, you know, those are, those are good numbers. Mm -hmm. 
And as, as part of kind of ramping up the, the Sapphire XC, you noted some investments to scale your manufacturing capabilities and, and network, and also that some of the early XC units would be a little bit lower margin as you kind of ramp up the platform. Can you help us think about maybe, Bill, the, the overall gross margin trajectory of the business near term, and then what that looks like once you've kind of fully scaled up? Sure. Um, let me just, on that prior question, the, the two scenarios that we've talked about for unit volume in 2022 are uh, 48 total with 50% uh, XC, 50% Sapphire, and then 62 split, 27% uh, XC, 73 Sapphire. So th those were the numbers in our analyst day presentation from a couple months ago. Um, with respect to margin, um, in the third quarter, as we noted, we um, our margin was impacted by the costs of, of creating the extra capacity that it's going to take in order to build and to service at a significantly higher volume uh, in 2022 than we're currently at today. So you know, our guidance for 2021 is 26 million. Uh, the outlook that we provided for 2022 is 89 million. So we have to put in place the capacity to build and service at a scale that's you know almost four times where we are today. So that impacted margin um, in, uh, uh, in the third quarter. Um, we also had some uh, things that are of a less frequently recurring nature that impacted margin that we, we talked about on the call. Um, you know, the, we're, we're going to have several cross currents impacting margin next year, and so we, we're not in a position to provide um, specific guidance, but let me talk about some of the factors. So one factor is that we'll be operating at much larger scale, so that obviously you're amortizing your fixed costs over a larger base. That should be a positive to margin. We're going to have to add cost um, people and cost in absolute dollars. So absolute dollars will go up, but scale goes up. So you, you have a positive to margin and a negative there. Uh, and then the another factor that will impact margin um, in, in a negative way is that in any major new manufacturing program, the early units are at higher cost than the later units in the, um, in the program. And so we're going to be delivering a lot of those early units um, in Q1. Um, so that that will negatively impact margin. Over the long term, you know, our goal uh, is to is to get to a 50% gross margin, um, but that's you know that's going to take time um, because we've got you know we've got work to do on scaling production. We've got work to do on on um, you know, component uh, cost. Um, so as we scale, we're going to have the opportunity to to bring down component costs, but that's going to take time. Um, so that journey to a 50% gross margin is going to be a multi-year. Um, uh, multi-year journey is what I would say. Can, can I add maybe someone, yeah. something to this? So if you think about this kind of the prudent conventional way to scale up production of a program like the CFRC would be to produce one or two systems, uh, take a break, do lessons learned, produce few more, take a break, do lessons learned, and kind of gradually scale this up. We actually don't have the luxury to do this because uh, we have kind of a high class problem of a lot of customers that want a lot of those systems really urgently. Some of these customers are, customers really need them for programs that are already running. So we deliberately decided to scale our production before this stage of optimization of manufacturing costs. So what we are going through is basically in 2022, we're going through a very accelerated ramp up, which means that the cost of manufacturing is inflated uh, as we are preparing for all kinds of scenarios to be able to provide those systems. The good news about that is that as we are going through this ramp up, we are learning very, very quickly because we have quite a few systems that we are manufacturing. So uh, instead of making those improvements over a long time, we anticipate that uh, we'll be able to make throughout 2022 rapid improvements in manufacturing costs. But those are likely to manifest themselves in 2023, not in 2022. So 2022, because of this very rapid uh, growth and because of uh, the need to deliver those systems to customers urgently, uh, we decided just to focus on uh, throughput and on uh, speed and uh, uh, postpone the margin improvement uh, to uh, later. And I think you've also been making some investments in, in headcount and R&D to kind of mm -hmm. attack the growth opportunity that, that you've seen. Uh, I'm curious if you could just maybe touch on how confident you are in achieving your target for positive adjusted EBITDA by 2023 um, that you laid out in some of your earlier presentations sure. this year. Yeah, I think um, that we, you know, we're learning a lot as we scale manufacturing, as Benny, um, as Benny discussed. So, um, I, and you know, we're 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 learning a lot. We're encountering costs. Um, we're figuring out how to solve challenges. We're focusing on getting the systems to customers and ramping the top the top line as fast as we can. So, um, you know, I think 
in, in the grand scheme of things, whether we're, you know, in, in what we indicated in our analyst day presentation is that we're going to you know, be at 89 million next year, that we're going to grow at 70 to 80 percent per year after that. Um, you think that whether we're plus or minus 10 million of EBITDA either way in 2023 isn't important relative to the rate at which we're growing the top line. Um, so, you know, we're not really in a position to, to be very specific about that. But we, our, I think it's important for investors to understand our priority is to put in place the capacity and the people to drive the top line at the kind of growth rate that we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to give you a context, right, next year we'll almost quadruple our revenue. The year after that and beyond that, we plan to grow above 70%. So our focus is to enable this growth. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, if the EBITDA is going to go 10 plus or minus $10 million, uh, with the cash level that we have, it actually doesn't matter to anything. So really, it's all about growing the... If you look at the price, the price is there is a billion dollar opportunity a few years out there. We have to get there as quickly as possible. And, and Bill, maybe this is this is one for you too. You know, following the merger with Jaws Bit Fire that brought you guys to the public market, you're sitting on a, a pretty healthy cash position, I think over 250 million. Uh, can you talk about kind of your capital allocations priorities with this, and then kind of how you're thinking about managing the capital structure of the business uh, sure. over the longer term? So yeah, our capital allocation priority, uh, the first priority is to fund our growth. Um, an equally important priority is to have a large cash cushion because we're going to large uh, OEMs and and you know, selling them on adopting our technologies, a core cool manufacturing technology for critical products in their portfolio, you know, for the long term. So it's important that they be confident that we're not just some small Silicon Valley company, that we're a significant company that's going to be around for the long term. Uh, so in order to, to give people that confidence, we want to have a large cash cushion. So those are the two most important priorities. Fund growth, have a big cash cushion. Beyond that, you know, we'll look at... Um, uh, we did we did point out in our 10Q that we paid down um, a significant portion of our debt because there was a, a large negative carry between the interest rate on the debt and the current earning rate on the cash. Um, so we paid off at 20 million of debt. Um, beyond that, you know, I think we're going to be opportunistic. Um, as we said in response to the last question, our priority is in driving the top line at that 70 to 80 percent growth rate and taking advantage of, you know, what we see as a uh, as a huge market opportunity. So. Yeah, I, one, one thing to probably say, uh, we stated that before, we, I want to re restate that, we are not going to build 3D System 2.0. Uh, we are not uh, buying a supermarket of 3D printing companies. So we, we, we know who we are, we are focused on what we are trying to build, and we'll go there mostly organically. So we are, we're not going on a shopping spree for companies. And I, I think we're, we're getting closer, but maybe I'll try and sneak one more in. And you talked about the supply chain that you're building and how that's so important. Can you maybe expand on that a little bit and then also talk about how you're kind of navigating the current supply environment, kind of the impacts you're seeing, any component tightness, and, and your outlook there? Yeah. So, so um, on the, on the uh, supply contract manufacturers, so it's important to explain that when we say contract manufacturers, who do we refer to? So uh, the people that we refer to are... Uh, companies that are manufacturing, mostly using machining, CNC machining and the like, uh, parts for the aerospace industries, the in energy industry, the capital equipment industry. So these are qualified suppliers, high quality suppliers that have been in business for many years, doing really high quality work for those companies. We are adding another layer to their capabilities, the layer of additive manufacturing. Uh, this is not uh, changing the DNA of the company. This is not changing the makeup of the company. It's another technology that they add to the portfolio of technologies that they already are using. Uh, one thing that we are not doing is we are not working with the so-called service bureaus that are the traditional 3D printing houses. We are working with professional manufacturers. We are adding to them another layer. As we are bringing these companies on board, it's really critical that we drive demand to these companies. So they are using copy exact technology to provide very uh, um, repeatable quality to their customers. But uh, in order for them to grow, uh, the demand has to fuel this growth. So um, as we are adding new materials, as we're expanding the regions in which we operate and we're expanding the markets and the kind of the industries in which we operate, we are uh, bringing new contract manufacturers and uh, new machines to contract manufacturers. And uh, we are committed, and we have demonstrated this commitment in action, driving demand to those contract manufacturers. So roughly speaking, uh, we have roughly 10 OEMs that operate a number of machines each uh, producing parts. We have roughly 10 contract manufacturers that have our machines producing parts for others. And we have about 100 contract, uh, OEMs that buy, machine, that buy parts from our contract manufacturing network. So you see this ratio of 10 to 1 
between OEMs that want to buy parts and OEM that wants to vertically integrate and manufacture parts. So uh, we have a whole system in place and a whole uh, 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 workflow to drive demand to find those OEMs that want to buy parts and help them consult them and then bring them to our contract manufacturing network. And this creates a lot of stickiness both with the OEMs and with the contract manufacturing network because this is frankly extremely rare that a company like ours, a solution provider, is uh, feeding its customers with demand. Uh, but uh, we are doing this as, 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 a, as a mission to drive adoption in this industry. Great. I think uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Benny and uh, Bill, thanks so much for uh, joining us here today. It's Thank you so much. Great to have you. Great.